You are now watching On Point, a news and public affairs show from California State University, Northridge. Good afternoon and welcome to On Point. For today's show, we will be discussing the impact of digital devices on children in their developmental years. With technology being more integral in our daily lives, we are looking to uncover whether daily exposure to handheld devices is hurting them or if it is classified as a tool for growth. I'm your host, Leah Vialpando, and tonight we're going to hear from two insightful guests, behavioral technician Isabella Zertucci and parent Maria Oquendo from their views on this matter. So first, we're going to go ahead and start off with Isabella. Hi, Isabella. Thank you for coming. Yes, of course. Hello. So my first question is, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your profession? Like, what is being a behavioral technician? Yes. So I am currently 21 years old, and I work as a behavioral technician, which also classifies as applied behavior analysis. I basically work with children that are on the spectrum and I provide behavioral therapy for them which consists of different programs and helping them with their social skills as well as their behavioral issues that they have with their families at home. And how long have you been working? There? I've been working there for over a year. And so since our topic is on devices, how have you seen devices impact the children that you work with? So I've seen impact with their behavior by wanting only their iPads. So when I work with them, I mostly try to keep them away from their iPads, but it does get pretty hard because the one thing that they work for is their iPad. So I try to engage with them, I try to play with them with their regular toys, and then immediately they ask for iPad. So I've noticed a, a increase in uh, wanting that specific just reinforcer. Um, and you noticed that you, you said that you see an increase. Mm -hmm. Around when did that increase start? Definitely during and after COVID. So I have worked with children pre-COVID and they were just more talkative with each other, more social. They wanted to go and play and color and be more artistic. And now I notice the way that they engage with each other is by sitting down next to each other and going on their iPads and getting engaged with different apps and just different things on their iPad. And when they're on their iPads, those things that they engage with, are they like games or are they educational? What is it exactly that they're using? I've seen both. I've seen a lot of games, but more educational ones, but they definitely just, I've seen a lot of Roblox. That's mm -hmm. like one of the main ones that I've seen, especially because I work with children that are about the age of six or seven. So I've seen a lot of just um, Roblox and Papa Rhea games. I, with, when I worked with like babies, like three-year-olds, I've seen a lot of educational, like the frog game. I'm not sure what it's called, but mm -hmm. it's like a learning frog. And I've also seen different like gross motor, like trying to learn that, but through the iPad rather than actually doing it in mm -hmm. person. And what is the age range? Because you mentioned babies, but also six to seven. So what's the age range that you work with? My work, we work all from ages two all the way to 25. But I personally haven't worked with anyone past the age of 16. So the youngest I worked with was two, and then the oldest I worked with was 16. And with that big gap, what are the, the differences between the ones who are younger and the ones that are older? What do you see with them connecting with their devices? For the younger ones, I definitely see a lot more behaviors and a lot more need for someone there with them. Even though with children on the spectrum, they do have a harder time trying to make connections with people that don't that aren't labeled with ASD. Um, and then the older ones, I see a lot of independence, wanting to be alone. I don't see much like iPad usage because they know how to kind of have those social skills in place rather than needing that reinforcer and needing that specific thing to work for. And um, going back to like the iPad usage, um, what, is, what would you describe as a, an excessive amount of time to be on your iPad? Okay, so when I work with my children, I ask the parents how long they've been on it before I get to our session and how long they have after. And when I'm there right from school, so around 3 p.m., they'll get their iPad and then I start work with them at 3.30 or 4 o'clock and then that's the only time they have it. After I leave, I ask and they have it for about six or seven hours before they go to bed. So what, around what time did you say you leave? I leave around six o'clock. 
And they said six hours after. Mm -hmm. So up until like midnight, they're yeah. on their iPads. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, they so don't really have much like structure when it comes to going to sleep and just different things. And um, how have you worked with the parents into controlling screen time? Have you mentioned that to them? How, how does that work? Yeah, so during session, I know when I'm there, they try to limit it. They'll give me the iPad, so when they are doing really well during the session, I can reinforce them with it, but I've talked to them before, and it's just pretty hard. I know that working with children with ASD, especially having a child with ASD, it's pretty hard because they just don't know how to help them. Like, they want to be independent. They don't want to play with anyone. Engagement is a really big one that I tell parents, like, hey, you can read with them. You can color with them. You can play Play-Doh. I know my child really enjoys playing Play-Doh. So it's just different for every parent. But a majority of them have had to just reinforce them with iPad time. And you mentioned uh, engagement. So is that with, when you work, is it like one-on-ones or do you do with like various children, like at the same time? Did they it's one-on-one. On one. One on yeah, one. it's one-on-one. Okay. On one. So I mostly just go to their house and then my client right now has a playroom. So I mostly just stay in the playroom with them and I engage, I play with their toys. I try to get them to do their programs that I'm there for. And I try not to use the iPad as much. And um, since you've been working for a while, have you ever worked with someone who has a controlled screen time? How does that look like? Yeah, I have. Um, they're only allowed to have it after they've done their homework and ate dinner, and it's only for an hour. And they're restricted a lot. Their iPad was completely restricted. They could not watch certain television shows. They couldn't watch certain YouTube videos that they were watching. So I've seen that. And what was the behavioral difference in a child with a controlled screen time versus one that didn't? It was definitely way bigger of a difference in behavior-wise just because children with ASD, they tend to mock things that they see. So if a child sees someone kicking someone, they'll go ahead and try to do that with their parent, their sibling, with me even. And with that child, it was just very silent. Like, he would just play on his own, he wouldn't really engage with much things. He was just very independent, which is kind of different from other children I worked with just because they're, they're independent, yes, but they also love having something in their hands and like that child, he just loved to read. And reading is like a whole thing that people have been talking about with like iPad babies as people call them, that they don't read as much. How have you seen the children that you work with? What, how are their reading levels? How is that working? Um, a lot of them do have higher reading levels, and then a lot of them just completely don't like reading at all. Um, my client right now loves to read, so when he reads, I can read with him for hours, but I do notice when I read with him, he doesn't really enjoy it as much as I wish he would have. But his reading levels are actually way higher. I think he is in first grade, and he has a third grade reading level. So that's, that's like interesting, is it's not like, how people expect, people think just because the kid's on the iPad, they don't read. So even though your child is on the iPad, they still read? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do, especially because the parents do implement a lot of reading time. Well, thank you so much for giving me all this information. And we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. But when we return, we will speak with Maria Okendo to acquire an understanding of the reality of parenting little ones who were brought into the world during the age of technological prominence. I felt accomplished after I got my diploma. It made me feel that I could take on whatever challenges life throws at you. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Welcome back to On Point. Today we're diving deeper into the impact of technology on early childhood development and our guest Maria Okendo is here to provide an introspective look into what it is like for a mother to raise children in the digital era. So welcome, Maria. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. So my first question is, how many kids do you have, and how old? One. One. And she's seven. She's seven. Mm -hmm. And around what age did she start using digital devices? So um, my, my daughter gets car sick, which I didn't know until she was around four when she was able to tell me, uh, Mommy, I feel sick, and blah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, during that time, pretty much since she was like six months until she was about 
two, two and a half, the only way I could have her in the car was with the iPad. I never knew why. I self-criticized myself about it all the time because I didn't want her to get attached to the iPad. Um, obviously, I was not raised like that, so I didn't want that for her. But I had no choice. There was no way she would throw up in the car. And I thought it was because she wanted the iPad so much. Mm -hmm. And so she, it did create an attach, um, obviously, because car sickness is not only while we're in the car, but also when you get out of the car, the first 40, 45 minutes maybe, you're still nauseous. Mm -hmm. So she will want to continue. She needs to get distracted. And, um, and so she was attached pretty much around s from six months to about two years and a half. And after two years and a half, how did that go into, she wasn't using the iPad as much anymore in the car after two and a half? I decided one day that I was just gonna take it away. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what, I'm done. I, I can't do this. I can't have her with all these toys and just watching the iPad all the time. So I hit it and um, it was obviously a team effort, both my husband and I. Um, and when she was in the car, I will give it to her only when we were riding in the car. But I kind of already knew that she never liked to be in the car. I never put two and two together and figured that it was because of car sickness until she was up around four. And then it made a lot of sense. Um, but then I also realized that if I put music mm -hmm. in the car, that will also soothe her, especially yeah. the songs, because at two and a half, she kind of knows songs already. So music was your way of like moving it on to a different thing other than just iPads. So what other, how, how was that switch with, from the iPad to music and how was, how was her reaction to it? Well, first when I took it away from her cold feet pretty much, uh, she looked for it and, and she wasn't communicating much. That's why I got concerned. And she was, at one, she had all her developmental stages and she was saying his 10 words or something like that. I don't remember very well. But at two, she wasn't saying any words again. And I'm like, what happened? And we did occupational therapy and, and the doctor referred us to parenting um, classes. Um, and we did all that. But, you know, I stopped the iPad and she was looking for it, but kids adapt quick, like two or three days and she was already playing with her toys, oh. which is what we wanted. Yeah. Uh, and the music, it was kind of the same thing, like she will ask for it or she would look for it, but uh, we ended up like singing together in the car, you know, just the same songs over and over again. But it was still better than, than iPad for me and my, you know, head I yeah. think as a mom I guess and now now that she's seven how do you see her digital device usage is it excessive reasonable what's it like now well we have limits mm -hmm. um, we do the the parent uh, I don't know what is it called and on the iPad the actual Apple iPad you have options to put how many hours per day and what times is she allowed so we have um, started from a 30 in the morning because that's the time she usually goes to school so she wouldn't have it uh, at a time uh, and only until 8.15 at night um, and she's only allowed a couple of hours two hours so we, I had it before at two and a half then I reduced it but then I was looking at the average usage per day and it's about an hour and 15 minutes so she doesn't even get to use that much so um, she's fine I mean she sometimes she tells me I need more time um, you have to put, a pa put the password if we are, let's say, we, we took a road trip not too long ago. Um, it is a big thing for us to take a road trip because she still gets car sick. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want to listen to her music the entire seven hours that we're driving. Um, then I will give her more time to be on the iPad. And, and we have also the age appropriate, um, you know, YouTube Walk. kids yeah. and it's according to her age and all that. And what does she usually use? Like is it educational apps? Are they games? What is it exactly that she's... No, like? mostly YouTube kids. Like she wants to be a YouTuber right now. <laughs> 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 like watching other kids playing with toys that mm -hmm. sometimes she has at home or she wants to ask for <laughs> to mm -hmm. uh, things like that.
Mm -hmm. Okay. And then was there any challenges in, I know you described that she's actually pretty good at it, you know, hour and 15 is better than, I know our last guest was talking about kids with eight hours of iPad usage, but was there any challenges maybe when she sees other kids in school who talk about games and apps or anything like that, or she's confident with her iPad use? Um, I think she's, she's okay. She doesn't really ask me for more. I mean, between coming back from school, doing homework, having dinner, showering and going to bed, she really doesn't even have enough time to go the full two hours. Mm -hmm. um, she also, before we gave her an iPad, this is something new, we gave it to her in last Christmas. She got her own iPad to, you know, pick and have her password and all that. Um, but before that, we, w we also tried giving her uh, a Switch, a Nintendo mm -hmm. Switch. She's not big on video games. Um, she only has like Mario Kart. <laughs> um, but I thought at one point that that was safer than h giving her an iPad because then there is limited, uh, unlimited options on, on the website, of course. Yeah. Um, so we tried that for some time, but then at the end she was like, Mom, I'm bored. <laughs> I already finished this game. And they're pretty expensive. So I'm like, I don't want to buy too, too many. And I don't want her to get hooked up into video games either. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, she talked with her friends and she kept saying, my friends have iPads. And I'm like, okay, we'll see what Santa says. And, and we did that. Um, but she's okay. I mean, she never really asked for more time, except when it's like a big exception mm -hmm. is road trips. And how do you encourage her to participate in like other hobbies and other activities? Like what does she do other and how did you encourage that? Well, she's an only child, mm -hmm. so she plays with a lot of her dolls. Uh, she calls my toys all the time, and my toys, my toys are telling me this or that. So, pretend play it's a big thing uh, for her. I think for I think I read somewhere that for a lot of only childs it is. Uh, so we're not concerned on that side. Her imagination is very active, and she has all these different names and. <laughs> um, voices for her dolls and all that, so it's, it's cute. Um, but we also, uh, you know, take her to swimming classes. Uh, my husband and I are very outdoorsy, so we do campings and we bring her sc scooter with, with it and we went to Yosemite, we do like biking and she was in the tandem bike with that and she loved that and, you know, so we and we, that's a yearly thing for us. So she's already used to that. We travel to, and she likes those things. Okay. It's adventures, she calls it adventures. That's, that's so good. That's good yeah. that she has that like other sense other than just online. Yeah. Well, thank you. Stay tuned as we uncover more insights into navigating the digital world with your little ones because when we return, we'll observe the perspectives of the general public regarding the tech savvy toddlers of today's age. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. Hello and welcome back to On Point. Now let's delve into our next segment with a closer look at the thought-provoking perspectives gathered by our reporter, Daniel Herrera. My son, uh, the 18-year-old, he, he, everything was more supervised. Um, now with, uh, with my eight-year-old, I mean, she get just, she just, Google whatever she wants and watch it and I think some of that um, affects our kids emotionally. I mean she's kind of addicted to it but I guess it depends on like the parents and them controlling how much usage they get so. So growing up uh, my sister always had you know the luxury of you know faster internet you know didn't have to go through AOL uh, eventually iPods and iPads came out and she was already still very young, uh, you know, barely elementary school age. So I feel like the access and the development of technology actually helped her uh, develop in terms of thinking. Ahorita, los niños, la verdad. Right now, the truth is that kids get phones at seven or six years old and they're always on their phone to a point where they may get mad. A lot of the time they'll put the phone close to their face, like right here. That is bad for their eyes. They get mad when you take away their device. They always want to be on it, and that is bad for them. The reality is that we didn't have that before. So what were your thoughts and reaction to the video? 
Um, a lot of the things they were saying was completely right. Like the last dad at the end, he was saying how closely they start putting their phones or their iPads to their face. And I noticed, I remember when I was younger, that was something that my parents were like, don't go anywhere near the TV, stay close back, like don't go anywhere near it. So I do see that in it more often that they just want to get like inside of their iPads. Yeah. What about you? What do you think? I agree that with the lady who said that it all depends on the parents. Um, I feel like it was a big thing and it's not easy. It's easier said than done to put limitations and um, have consequences. And um, if anything, sometimes if they like it so much, it's a good way to give a consequence. I'll take it away from you. I'm not even going to give you the one or two hours that you get a day if you know you didn't do homework or if you didn't do whatever the chores they had to do. So I, I think that um, the parents putting limitations have a lot to do with it. And I want to actually get back to that a little bit later because I do want to know more about tips and all of that. Um, but before we get started onto that, I wanted to know if there was anything that surprised you about the package, anything that you didn't see, uh, uh, relate to, Izzy? Um, with the video? Mm -hmm. Oh. Um I guess it is a different perspective from like the parent view because I don't have children, I just work with them. So I only work for a certain amount of hours throughout the day. So it just, it surprises me that I won't get to experience that until I'm a parent. So it's just kind of different from my perspective. And Maria? Uh, one thing that I don't agree. Mm -hmm. Wait, yeah, I'm surprised, yeah. Uh, oh, surprised. Um, no, I, I guess I do agree. I, I mean, I see it a lot. I I happen to work sometimes with kids too, uh, although I only have one. So I try to, if I, if I didn't have uh, limitations for my daughter, she will be all over the iPad all day long. So I definitely agree with that part, but I do think that it is possible and it is definitely doable to be able to put limitations. It, it is a team effort, like I said before, so everyone in the household has to be uh, on top of it um, because it's not easy if there's not consistency, but um, it, it is something that could get easy, easily out of control. And with that, how do, you, how do you think iPad uses or device usage affects families as a whole? Um, well, mom and dad sometimes may not agree. Um, sometimes one of, one of them could be more patient than the other one. So if the other one is less patient, it is easier to be like, okay, here, just be on your iPad. And that happens, I'm sure, a lot, especially when parents have, both of the parents are working and they just want to rest and, oh, come on, just be on your iPad. Um, or sometimes having two jobs. I mean, it, it is all a dominant effect of, you know, the society that we live on. You know, like if we have two jobs, each mom and dad, then of course you don't have that patience. And how have you seen it affect all families, like the families that you've worked with as well? Um, I've seen that as well where like, I've seen more dads do it rather than mothers where they'll give the iPad up so quickly and the mom's kind of like fighting for it, like don't give it to them, just wait till after dinner. But I think it's a lot of connecting, especially with the children I work with. A lot of them just want their parents, even though they can't really communicate that, they just want to like, have that attention. And I remember when I was growing up, I wanted like all of my attention from my family and my siblings especially. So implementing the iPad usage is just like putting one more barrier in between them, the families. So you had explained that you have of course built that relationship with the iPad in your child. So I wanted to ask, what tips do you have for, parents, for children and for parents? Um, to have those limitations, I mean, I use, I read videos, uh, I mean watch videos, and uh, how to implement the block of the, uh, from one what time to what time, and also how much time she can be on the iPad. So that was, that's always been the one that I use so far. I can also see where she, which website she visit and all that. And you had last mentioned a rewards, like kind of system, how does that work as well? 
Um, yeah, if she doesn't do the chores that she's supposed to, we have a reward chart. It's something that we implemented not too long ago. Um, and if she doesn't do all the 22 stickers that she's supposed to be getting from the chart, she doesn't get uh, whatever she wants to do on the weekend. Uh, but also if she had a really bad day where she didn't want to do anything on the reward chart, then I would tell her, you know, I'm going to take away your iPad today. There is no iPad today until you clean up your room or pick up your toys, something like that. Thank you. And Isabella, what do you think um, are tips for parents? Um, let's see. I think just limiting it more often, especially because I said earlier, I see a bunch of parents that just basically give them complete freedom over their iPad. And I do have a few I did have a few clients where they were just very aggressive because of the things they were watching. So I think the blocking certain YouTube videos or programs that they watch or giving them that time, the self-care with themselves for the iPad time. And where do you see the future of um, technology affecting education? How do you see that happening? I think we're going to be transferring to education more often rather than stepping back from it, especially because of how technology is advancing with AI and all of the different things that we see right now, especially in college. So I think we're mostly mo moving towards going to full te technology. And as well as um, for your child, how do you see that technology in the classroom, all of that? What do you think? Yeah, she, she has an iPad uh, since kindergarten. Uh, she gets to uh, keep it at home even over the weekends but it is limited only to the educational apps um, but yeah I, I mean I think that I I'm okay with her if it's for her education it's okay because she has to be up to date with technology and so are we so do we uh, the p as parents too so we can support and help her out in whatever she struggles to learn through technology so um, I, I can see that uh, that's going to get bigger and bigger as she keeps uh, going through the next grades. And one more thing about, you had mentioned the last segment, like not being a parent yet, but that it will be in the future. How do you see the next generation raising children? I'll start with you, Izzy. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think it is going to be a lot more iPad usage and just new technology, especially because Right now, we are advancing to it, so a lot of us are watching it right now and seeing what other parents are doing, and we're probably going to fall into the same shoes as they do because it is really hard to have a child, and me working with just children is really hard. And Maria, you as well, how do you think it's going to be in the next generation? I don't know, maybe robotics? I mean, I don't think we're going <laughs> to lose teachers, <laughs> and um, I think there's definitely going to be like some robotics maybe involved. Um, you know, the uh, being able to ask Google Alexa for things maybe too in, in a classroom, I don't know. It, it could go anywhere, I think. Yeah, that's true. Then we don't know yet, but yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for both joining us today. That's a wrap for today's On Point show. Thank you as we explore the impact of technology on our youngest generation. We hope you enjoyed this topic and would like to thank our insightful guests for joining us and sharing their perspectives with us. We'll see you next time. <laughs>